This week's uh, Parsha of Aloscha records for us many incidents uh, that, that occurred uh, in this second year when the Jewish people were in the desert of Sinai. Almost all of the incidents were negative. And they would lead up to uh, next week's Parsha of Shlach. Uh, that uh, dooms that generation uh, to destruction in the desert and the fact that they would not live to come to Eretz Yisrael. In the, one of the incidents, the Torah tells us a story, but we don't really know what the story is. <clears throat> that uh, Yisro, Moshe's father-in-law, uh, somehow uh, re, uh, goes back to Midian. He leaves the Jewish people. And uh, Moshe is very disturbed by that. And uh, Yisro is a very enigmatic figure. We don't really know much about him. The Medrash. Uh, uh, casts him as one of the advisors for Paro, which would have made him a very aged person at this time. And uh, he was Chohen Midyon. That's how the Torah describes him. He's the priest of Midyon, meaning he was a person of notoriety, a person of influence, a person that had official position. And his daughter Tsipora marries Moshe, and they have uh, two sons that are descendants of Yisra. And uh, we find that he also, uh, Aaron marries into the family, Aaron's children. And that's one of the uh, accusations that the Jewish people will make against Pinchas is that his Zayde was a Kohen for Avodah Zorah and he's killing, uh, you know, a member of the Sanhedrin. So Yisro is this mysterious figure. Now the Torah tells us that Yisro came, it says, Vayishma Yisro, so Rashi immediately says, Mashmua Shoma Ubo. What did Yisro hear? So Rashi says that he heard uh, the uh, miracles of Yamsuf and Milchemes Amolek. That the Jewish people made war on Amolek and they were successful. And they, uh, that's what he heard and that's why he came. According to most uh, Midrashim, Yisro is present for uh, Maimed Har Sinai. Now Yisro uh, gives advice to the Jewish people. He sets up the uh, civil service, so to speak. He tells Moshe, Lo tov asher You're not doing it right. It's uh, the prerogative of father-in-law to say that. And uh, so I'll be because of Yisro Nishadsha Parsha Batorah. The whole Parsha in the Torah because of him. Sorry, Chamishim, sorry, Meo, sorry, I love him, everything because of him. So all of this until now is very positive. And uh, according to most opinions, Yisro is present for uh, Mamad Harsina. Because if he came because of Amalek, so then he was around that Mamad Harsina would take place later. And he is present at Mountain Torah. He's also present for Diego and for uh, the. Uh, difficulty that's involved there 
and he's present for the miracle and the mon and the well. He's there for everything. So why does he so leave? And why doesn't he listen to Moshe? Please don't leave. Don't desert us. Because you, uh, your counsel is necessary. Your opinion is necessary. We can benefit from you. And he said, no, no, I'm not staying. Kim El Arziv, I'm I'm going home to my uh, family to move. So Rashi puts a positive spin on it also. And Rashi says he went to be Megayer, people in Midian, especially his family. So that it isn't, as he was so overcome with the grandeur of Maimed Har Sinai and with the Amuna of Klal Yisrael that he wanted to bring that message back to Midian, to his family. And therefore, uh, what he did was with good intent. Uh, we always know that, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intent. But, uh, but it's a positive spin on him. It isn't just that he deserted. Other Mephorshim don't give him that credit. Other Mephorshim said he went back for money, he went back because he had position there, he went back because he realized that he would not rise to any high position amongst the Jews, etc., etc. Where did Rashi get this idea that he went back for good purposes? What drives her? So generally speaking, you'd always say that Rashi looks for the good in people. When Rashi has a choice, he always looks for the good in people. We find that by Noach, he said, Noach, you know. So Rashi brings the Yesho, and you know, if he would have lived in Avram's time, he would be better. We have to always say good things about people. So uh, Rashi is driven by the fact that we find later in Tanakh, by uh, the war of uh, Borok and Sisra, and Torah and Avia. So there was a group of people there that are identified as the descendants of Yisra, B'nai Kani. And they're living in the Galil. So who were they? How did they get there? And what were they? So most of them, for him, say that they were Geri Toshov which is a status of a non-Jew who is allowed to live in Israel in a Jewish society, but he's not a Ger Tzedek. He doesn't worship Avodah Zarah, etc., but he's not bound by the mitzvahs. He doesn't have to observe Shabbos. He doesn't observe Kashras. None of that applies to him, but he's allowed to. He's part of the society that we live in. There's a discussion in Halacha whether such a creature exists in our time as well. And the whole basis for uh, the dispute on the Heter Mechira on Shemitah revolves a little about this issue because we sell the land to a Muslim. Is a Muslim living in Israel a Ger Toshev? If he's not a Ger Toshev, if he's considered to be a Nochri, so then there's a law in the Torah of Lo Sechonim. You're not allowed to sell land to such a person. So the Nitziv said in his famous dispute with Rabbi Tzkochonim on the Heter Mechira, so he said that the Heter Mechira falls because he said they wanted to get out of an Isser to Rabbonin which is Shemitah, Bizman 
and they transgressed an Iser Daraisa of Lo Sechone. Rav Kook in his famous Sefer Shabbos Oharetz, and Rav Kook was a uh, Talmud of the Nitziv, he disagrees with his Rebbe, and he uh, brings many, many proofs uh, that the Muslims can be considered, the Arabs can be considered Gerim, and the, the idea of a Ger Toshov, and therefore there's no Lisser of Lo Seichonim, and therefore the Hatta uh, Mechira is valid, doesn't violate that principle. But that's part of the problem. It's a very complicated issue. But uh, so, what, who were the B'nai Kani? Who were they? So, as I mentioned, some say that they were Gerim Toshovim, right? Uh, but they are relatives of Yisrael. They somehow came to Eretz Yisrael. So Rashi seems to be of the opinion that he went back and he was Megayer. He was, he was Megayer, them to be Gerim Toshovim. And then they emigrated, right? Like we have in our time, there are kibbutzim in the north that were made by uh, completely non-Jews. But a Nesamim, I think it's called. Moshav. Moshav and... Uh, so they, they come out of positive motives. They want to be part of uh, the experience of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, and they're not Jewish. So there is such an animal in the world. So those were the B'nai Kani. Others say, other Mephorshim say that the B'nai Kani were really Gerim. And it just mentions that they're descended from Yisra. But apparently they are the products of Yisra going back to Midian. And that's what Rashi means because he's got this incident in the book of Shoftim that describes somehow that Yisro's family is uh, settled in the Galil uh, and that uh, they were warned that they should vacate because the war is coming and they would be destroyed in the war otherwise as well. Now there's another twist, you know, and Jewish history is always with a twist. So there's a group of people now that live in the Galil. They live also in Syria. They're the Druze. Who are the Druze? Nobody knows. The religion of the Druze, they're a break off from Islam in the 18th century. So again, it's the same story. Somebody had a dream, it's always the same story, right? Some guy has, you know, he ate too much for supper and he had a dream and we got a new religion. Everybody has a revelation. So uh, the wonderful thing about the Druze is that their religion is a secret. And it's not only a secret to us, it's a secret to the Druze. They don't know what their religion is. <laughs> so there's only a few that know. But they're very happy, and, uh, you know, it's okay. Now they say they are descended from Yisra. They say they have a tradition, they're descended from Yisra. And in fact, uh, in the Druze city of Shvaram, there is a tomb that they say is the tomb of Yisra that Yisrael somehow came there to Israel, and that's his tomb. And they have a whole ceremony every year on a certain date that, that was, uh, that's his yard site and the whole thing. So, it, you know, like there's something to it. It's not, this can't be the story, but somehow it's floating around that Yisro's family and Yisro, you know, it's like, 
So the Torah is enigmatic. The Torah doesn't tell us what happened here. And uh, the, without Rashi, without the commentaries, the story looks very negative. Moshe begs him not to, and he says, no, I'm going anyway. And uh, there's no question that it hurt the morale of the Jewish people, because they said if he can't get his own father-in-law to go, why should we go? And that's part of the mood that we'll read about the next week's parsha of Shlach. That's why they believe the negative, and they don't want to go. So he weakened them. But on the other hand, uh, somehow he's still attached to us. And even thousands of years later, this is floating in the air that somehow he's still attached to us. We have some attachment. So uh, that's what it says, Tish Yatarets Kushios of Bias. When Elio Anavi will come, so we have a long list of questions. This will be one of the questions, right? What happened to Yisro? Where are they? Who are they? Until then, we have to have patience. Rabbi Hanan Yibn Akash, Yomer Ratz HaKadosh Baruch Hu L'Zakas Es Yisrael, Hafil Chachir B'Lahem Torah Mitzvah Shenemar, Adonai Chafei Tzaman Tzidko Yagil Torah Yagil. Torah Yagil. Torah Yagil. Amen. Hey, the good shot. Hey, the good shot.